The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with Rise and Shine. With everything that's been said and written on the subject, you certainly don't need me to tell you to take better care of your automobiles. And yet I'll bet that half of you still haven't done anything about that paint job. You can take it from me if you want your car to look presentable a year or two hence. You'd better give it an occasional cleaning and polishing now. And of course, do it the easy modern way. With Johnson's Car New, that both cleans and polishes in one application. Two jobs at once in quick time. In less time than you thought possible, Car New will have your car looking like it just came off the production line. That's why folks say your car looks like new when you use Car New. And here's an extra tip. If you want to give that rejuvenated finish maximum protection against sun and weather, try adding a coat of wax, either Johnson's Auto Wax or the regular household wax. By the way, Johnson's Car New is spelled C A R N U. Save what you have. Conserve. Make what you have do a little longer. That's the watchword nowadays. And the master of 79 Wistful Vista is not one to violate a national policy. So here, gazing speculatively at his last year's straw hat, we find Fibber McGee and Molly. McGee, what on earth are you going to do with that straw hat? What do you suppose I'm going to do with it? I'm going to wear it. Well, now, isn't that carrying conservation to extremes? Why, it looks terrible. Well, I'll either wear this this summer or I'll wear that checkered golf cap. Oh, no, no. No, not that, dearie, not that. Okay, so I'll wear this. What do they charge to clean a straw hat? Oh, 50 or 75 cents ordinarily. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I think they'd make a special rate of $4. <laughs> Why, I can get a new one for two ninety-five. dollars Well, that's what I was hinting at in my delicate way. <laughs> well, I'm not going to do it. The government wants us to conserve, and by the million merry men of the mighty MacArthur, I'm going to conserve. Well, when you get through with that miracle, you might take a minute off and invent a shower curtain that won't slap you in the face when your back is turned. <laughs> and vice versa. You <laughs> threw that in. Now, don't worry. I can make this hat look like you. We got any art gum? Now, listen, cleaning that thing with art gum would be like bombing Tokyo with confetti. <laughs> Well, doggone it, what do you use to clean a straw hat? Well, if everybody knew that, what would the people do uh, who clean them for a living? Okay, okay, I'll find a way. I'll bet the drugstore has got a preparation that'll clean straw hats. Give me the phone. Here. Thanks. Hello, operator. Give me Kramer's Drugstore on the corner of Mert. Is that you? Oh, <laughs> How's every little thing, Mert? Says, eh? What say, Mert? Your uncle. Smashed his face and broke one of his hands. Oh, what's the matter, McGee? Did he drop his watch? Oh, sure. <laughs> Hello, Mert. Now nah, she guessed it right off. <laughs> What's say, Mert? Okay, I'll call later. Say, look, dearie, I don't think the government would care if you threw that hat away and got another one. If you wear this one, it'll be bad for morale. Whose? Mine. Mm. Well, I'm sorry. I've made up my mind to clean this hat. And by the merry mighty men... No, I said that. <laughs> you know what I've made... You know when I've made up my mind? <laughs> Indeed, I do, precious boy. You're about as flexible as a poker. <laughs> and just as busy turning things up. <laughs> I got character. All us McGee's have got that old persistence need. We follow through. 
When we start something, we finish. You don't say. Yes, sir. How about that ship in the bottle you started to carve in the spring of 1928? Well, I got my finger stuck in the neck of the bottle and had to bust it. <laughs> I couldn't go through life waving a three-masted schooner at people, could I? Oh, I don't know. It might give you a little individuality. People would say, you know Fibber McGee. He's the man with the sloop on his pinky. <laughs> Well, gee whiz, a fella can't always just... Hey, we got any peroxide? I think so. What for? I bet I can clean my straw hat with that. It's a bleach, ain't it? Well, yes, I think it is. But I never heard of anybody cleaning a hat with it. Well, I'm going to try it anyway. What can I lose? Well, you can lose a hat. And I can lose a bottle of peroxide. But go ahead now. Where would the steamboat be today if Eli Whitney hadn't invented the cotton gin, is what I always say. <laughs> I'll go get you the peroxide, dearie. Where would the steamboat be today if Eli Whitney... Well, Whitney didn't invent the steamboat. What'd the cotton gin have to do with the steamboat if... Well, of course, they carried cotton in steamboats, but if Fulton hadn't... It... But Fulton didn't invent the cotton gin. That was Whitney. So if the steamboat had... Doggone it, I wish Molly had get her facts straight. I can't sit around here all day. Come in. Hi, mister. What you doing? Oh, hello, sis. I'm going to bring this Katie back to life. Hmm? I says I'm going to launder this lid. This straw hat. I'm going to clean it. How? Huh? Hmm? You says, how am I going to clean it? I know it. Well, that, sis, is a moot point. Oh. <laughs> What's the matter? Don't you know what a moot point is? Sure I do, I bet you. My uncle has a moot, and it's a pointer. <laughs> That's a mutt, not a moot. And you better run along now, sis. In a few minutes, I'm going to be deep in the heart of skimmer scraping. Can we talk business a minute, mister? Oh, business, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, as the furnace says, when the guy walks up with a nasty look, something tells me I'm going to be shook down again. <laughs> so let's get to it, sis. What's the racket? I don't hear anything. No. <laughs> I mean, what's your angle? What business are you referring to? You mean what am I selling? Seeds. Seeds? Sure. Vegetable seeds. Sparrowgrass seeds and radishes and cabbages and, and turnips and potatoes and marshmallows and petunias. Oh, 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 wait a minute. You can't eat petunias. You ever try any? Well, no, but petunias... And petunias and onions and carrots. <laughs> and cod liver oil. You can't plant cod liver oil either. You can as far as I'm concerned, mister. <laughs> I despise it. You want some seeds, hmm? No, I don't believe I can. Haven't you got a victory garden, mister, hmm, haven't you? <laughs> no, I, I've been thinking of starting one, but somehow look, I just... Look, look, mister, hmm? look. How can we win this war if everybody says, well, I've been thinking of doing something, but I never did it? Well, sis, you really got a point there, and I... My I'm... teacher says that every single vegetable we grow means so much more food for our soldiers and sailors. She says we got to have a green land here for those boys in Iceland. Well, that's a very good idea, and I she think... She says we have an ocean between us and Australia, and an ocean between us and Europe, and if we have an ocean that we can just sit around doing nothing, we better get smart. <laughs> <laughs> Your teacher is a very intelligent... She says that an army travels on its stomach, and if we don't keep them full of fuel, we just don't know our groceries. Well, you're absolutely right, sis. Give me two bucks worth of seeds. And I'll get to work and tomorrow. And furthermore, mister, huh? my teacher says it's much better to get blisters on our hands than calluses on our hearts. And whether we're buying bonds or planting vegetables, there's only one thing we got to do, and that's dig, dig, dig. <laughs>
clean? No, it's not very clean anyway. Nothing I've tried seems to work. Look at it. What makes it so fuzzy? This brush is kind of rough on it, I guess. Where'd you get that brush? Well, it ain't exactly a brush. It's it's Lillian's curry comb. <laughs> now, McGee, you take that right back to the garage. I won't let anybody else use my brush and comb, and I'm sure Lillian would feel the same way about it. Why won't you let anybody else use your hairbrush? Well, I just don't like the idea, that's all. Don't hurt your hairbrush any just to clean a straw hat with it. Maybe it won't. <laughs> McGee. <laughs> Did you use my hairbrush to scrub that awful old hat with? No, not very long. It was too soft and wasn't making any impression, so I just had to throw it away. Now, believe me, if we weren't going to have guests just at this minute, my fine amateur bonnet brusher, I'd... I'd what I'd... would you do? Well, nothing, probably. <laughs> I can buy another hairbrush, but amusing husbands are hard to get. <laughs> Come in. Hello there, kids. How are you fixed for Christmas cards? Christmas card. Aren't you jumping the gun a little, old-timer? It's eight months till next Christmas. I still got a dirty little deficit from the last one. Johnny, let's talk this over man to man. You mean I'm not in on this discussion, huh? You stay right here, daughter. In selling Christmas cards, it's the women that have the say-so. I'm convinced of that. How long have you been selling them? Uh... You're my first customer, but I'm easy convinced. <laughs> now, look at the first one in the book here. Happy, happy Yuletide from Canada to the Isthmus. Geography doesn't matter when we wish you Merry Christmas. <laughs> Does that one appeal to you? Now, please, Mr. Oldtimer, how can you expect anybody to get hopped up about Christmas right after Easter? That reminds me. I've got Easter greetings, too. Here's one that says, North or South, East or West, Easter with you is Easter at best. Only two dollars a dozen at grade with your no, name. No, your no, 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 no. <laughs> we don't want any. Come back in six or seven months and we might talk business, old-timer. Uh, six or seven months, eh? Yeah. I see. That'll be November. Better buy your Thanksgiving cards now and save me a trip. Here's one But that we says, don't want to. It says white meat, dark meat, all around the town. Hey. <laughs> Close the sample book and lay off, will you, old timer? We're not in the market. Why, well, it ain't like you, Johnny. You always was full of the holiday spirit. But if if that's how you feel about it, why well, the idea of Christmas cards at this time of the year? <laughs> At least he didn't try to sell us any Father's Day's cards. Got them right here, Johnny. Father's Day. <laughs> Here's to Papa Bless his heart, bone fat, not so smart. We love him and we no. love him. No. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Molly, I wonder if I couldn't clean this hat with just plain soap and water. Shall I soak it? I would, right out the window. <laughs> oh, you're not any help. Now, let me see. What might do the job? Toothpaste? Lighter fluid? Ammonia? Grease. Grease? What kind? Elbow. Mm, it'll take more than that. <laughs> I'm all out of peroxide, and it's going to take some chemical that'll bleach it yellow again. Don't tell me that hat was yellow, McGee. Well, it was yellow. Do you mean to tell me that any hat that would wear a band with purple polka dots out in public is yellow? <laughs> Look, Molly, will you please take this thing serious? Here I'm trying to save myself some dough. Hello, folks. Oh, hello, Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Harlow. Come on in and... What's you sniffing at? What's that odd smell? It's peroxide, Mr. Wilcox. Oh. McGee's been trying to bleach a straw hat. It's gone brunette on him. <laughs> well, why don't you do what I did last year, Fibber? What was that? Well, I took my Panama out of the closet and wore it down to the office. I didn't notice how soiled it was until people began to comment. Oh, it must have been embarrassing. Oh, no, it was. There I was, dashing in and out of the office all day, dictating letters about how Johnson's glow coat was such a marvelous labor and time saver because it eliminates rubbing and buffing and dries in 20 minutes or less to a beautiful, lustrous finish. Yes, but how about the hat? What hat? Oh, oh, oh my Panama. Yeah, yeah. Well, I still hadn't noticed how bad it looked. Yeah. And me so sensitive to dust and dirt, too, on account of selling Johnson's self-polishing glow coat so long. And glow coat being marvelous for soiled and dull linoleum. So when I finally got through with my work, which was mostly writing an advertisement about how glow coat preserves and protects your linoleum, and it's particularly important right now to conserve what you have... Yes, and... but the hat, the hat. Uh, what do you mean? What did you do with your Panama hat? I sent it out and got it clean. <laughs> There's still a funny smell in here. That, Mr. Wilcox, is McGee burning. <laughs> You want me to take your hat down to the cleaners on my way, Fibber? No, thank you. <laughs> okay, see you later. Clean. 
If that ain't... What the... was the matter with that now? When things get soiled, the logical thing to do is to get them cleaned with most people. Uh... But with you, the most logical thing to do is something fantastic. Look, the people who clean hats are human beings. I'm a human being. So I can clean a hat, too. I'm a human being, too. And so are the people who go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. But do I go yachting in a hog's head? Not in a pig's ear. <laughs> Oh, it's Mayor Latrivia. Come right in, Mr. Mayor. Good day, Mrs. McGee. Hello, McGee. Hi, Politico. Have a seat for your cynical. <laughs> no, thank you. I merely wanted to ask you, McGee, if you would serve on a committee of which I happen to be chairman. Mr. Mayor, asking McGee to serve on a committee is like waving a blue rag at a bull. You mean red, Molly. <laughs> With a blue rag, nothing would happen. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> What is the uh, committee, Mr. Mayor? It's to organize our citizens to write more letters to their friends and relatives, sons and brothers and fathers in the Army and Navy, and give them more news from home. Why, sure, Latrivia. I'm your man. When do I start? Tomorrow morning. The committee meets in my office at the City Hall at 10.30. Well, you bet I'll be there, because it's a good cause, too. Indeed it is. I was a captain in the Army during the last war, and I know how it is to get a letter from home. Oh, so you were a captain in the Army. An Annapolis man? Annapolis is a Navy school, McGee. Uh, don't they have captains in the Navy? Of course, but I happen to be in the Army. What's the matter, not smart enough to get into Annapolis? <laughs> I didn't try to get into Annapolis. Why not? You might have graduated as a general. They don't graduate students from Annapolis as generals, Mrs. McGee, and they don't have generals in the Navy. I thought you said you were in the Army. I was in the Army. Well, then, uh, what made you think you could ever be a general in the Navy? <laughs> I didn't think I could be a general in the Navy, Mrs. McGee. That was your idea. Go on. She didn't even know you then. <laughs> I didn't say she did. I merely said that the Army has nothing to do with Annapolis. Snobbish? Yes. No! <laughs> not at all. Annapolis is strictly a Navy school, and I, being in the Army, could not have got a commission there. What do you want a commission for? Couldn't you live on your salary? <laughs> yes, I could. I was merely trying to tell you that... McGee. Huh? Were you in the Army? Oh, indeed he was, Mr. Mayor. He was a private in the Engineer Corps. Do you still have that old Army spirit, McGee? You bet I do, the trivia. Fine. I was a captain, and I do too. Huh? Hey, Heavenly days, Mr. Mayor. You marched him right through the bay window. Yes. Isn't that too bad? Well, good day, Mrs. McGee. The King's Men sing Hey, Mabel. There's a girl who lives next door to me Who's got the fellas up, 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 up in a tree They all go for her in a great big way But she won't tumble down So here is what they say Mabel, Mabel, hey! When she's walking down the street, all the boys yell mighty sweet. Hey, Mabel! Wait for me! Wait for me! When she wears a diamond ring, all the boys begin to sing. Hey, Mabel! Wait for me! Wait for me! She's as popular as any girl can be. She's a household name in every family. But the one she wants so bad is the guy who yells like mad. Hey, Mabel, Mabel, wait, wait for me! Oh, Mabel, why won't you linger a while? Oh, Mabel, wait. Oh, Mabel, please wait for me. Hey, hey, wait. She goes a-strolling along down the avenue, and all the fellas rush out just to get a view. Hey, Mabel, <whistles> why don't you wait for me? Me too, me too. There ain't a fella in the neighborhood who wouldn't walk a mile To get a nod of her head or to see her smile Hey, Mabel! I wish you'd wait for me Four blocks around the fellas all have a notion they love her She is a peach on every family tree They want to shake it But the man she wants under the mistletoe He's just the guy who does nothing but whisper low. Hey, Mabel. And that's all, brother, but as long as there's a doubt about her, I'll keep a shouting. Hey, Mabel. Wait for me. You, for goodness sakes, what a...
What have you got all over your hand? Huh? Oh, this? It's an uh, Easter egg dye, Molly. What on earth are you doing with that now? Well, my straw hat was getting worse and worse looking and kind of streaked with pink and blue, so I tried dyeing it. Look. Oh, lovely. Uh-huh. <laughs> a robin's egg blue straw hat. How ducky. You think it looks too sissy to wear? Well, I think it'd be all right if you carried a cane. A cane? Me carry a cane? Well, if you wore that hat, you'd have to carry a cane. <laughs> or brass knuckles. Well, shucks. The men's fashion magazine's all safe. Oh, heavenly days. Hide that pastel atrocity, McGee. What for? I don't want anybody to think I'm the kind of a woman who has the kind of a husband who'd wear that kind of a hat. <laughs> oh, who cares? Come in. Ah, hello, Mr. Wimple. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. McGee. <laughs> Is that a new hat? It's not new, Mr. Wimbley. It's just died. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't know. That's a new hat you got on, too, ain't it, Wimp? Yes, it is, Mr. McGee. Does it seem a bit wobbly over my ears? <laughs> well, now that you speak of it, Mr. Wimple, it does seem a little tippy on the temples. Yes, Sweetie Face bought it that way. <laughs> she didn't take me along when she got it, and the clerk told her she could get a big one for the same price as a small one. And she didn't mind to know she'd married a little shrimp like me. Ah, oh, she was just kidding, Wimp. She was just pulling your leg. I know. And I wish she'd stop it. It keeps coming out of joints. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Wimple, does Sweetie Face pick all your clothes? No, just my pockets. <laughs> I, I caught her at it last week, and it made me simply furious. Uh-oh. I hope you didn't do anything drastic, like sticking your tongue out at her. Oh, no. I just said, Sweetie Face, I said, if you don't stop treating me like this, I'm going to run away. Oh, good for you, Mr. Wimple. Was she impressed? Indeed she was, Mrs. McGee. Ever since then, she's been wrapping my lunch up in road maps. <laughs> But I'd better be running along now. I've got to meet Sweetie Face at the Army Airport. Army Airport? What's you going to do out there? Some officer promised to take her up in a blimp, and he said I could come along for ballast. Oh. What's ballast? Oh, my gosh. Ballast. That's what they throw out if the balloon gets too heavy. Is it really? Sure. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll just fool him and not get back in again. Well, goodbye. <laughs> little man can take that treatment day after day is beyond me, McGee. Well, they say you can get used to anything in time. Though after 30 years, I still squawk about those 47 pins in a new shirt. <laughs> if I had a new shirt. But with... Hey, hey, what are you doing with my hat? Oh, I'm just tying a little green ribbon on it. Oh, but Molly, that Wait a minute, is... McGee. Huh? Can't look any funnier than it does now. What you mean? Now, where's that banana? Oh, there. And a huh? bunch of grapes. Huh? Now for a veil and a feather. Oh, Molly. <laughs> now wait till I try it on. There, now, how's that? Oh, my gosh, that looks awful. You've got a lot of nerve kidding around with my straw hat after all the work I've been to. Take it off, Molly, take it off. Oh, no, let me wear it, McGee, just for a laugh. <laughs> Come in. Take it off, take it off. Oh, Mrs. Uppington, hello, Abigail. Well, how do you do, Mrs. McGee and Mrs. McGee? Well, if it isn't 150 pounds of sugar. <laughs> May the 5th be good to you, Uppy. <laughs> Oddest things, really. <laughs> you have such a gusty sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> you mean breezy, Abigail. Uh, is that the same as windy, Mr. McGee? <laughs> Just about. Well, then that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I have the most wonderful news for you. You ain't moving out of town. What happens to Whatever gave you that idea, Mr. McGee? Oh, I don't know. I just thought quick of what was the most wonderful McGee. thing. Huh? Oh. What's the happy tidings, Abigail? Well, I have just thought of the most marvelous idea to conserve paper. I've written the government all about it. Oh, good for you, Uppy. What's the issue with the tissue? <laughs> you asking your creditors not to send you any more bills? <laughs> Go again, Mr. McGee. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell me, did you inherit your sense of humor from your grandfather? <laughs> what makes you think that, Abigail? <laughs> His jokes are so old. <laughs> But I must tell you, my dear, you know how important it is that we conserve paper. Sure, we know that, Abby. What about it? And you know that I was going to write a book about the history of Wistful Vistas? Yes, we know that. Well, I've decided not to write it. Isn't that wonderful? Think of the paper I'm saving. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I've been saving them a lot, a lot of rubber, too, by not making any mistakes when I write a letter. <laughs> <laughs> I'd better explain that joke, Abigail. You see, he writes his letters in pencil. 
Oh, he does? He, he always... Why, Abigail, what's the matter? Oh, my dear, I, I can't contain myself a moment longer. Where did you get that delightful hat? That hat? Why, that's just a... McGee, little... you really like it, Abigail? Oh. It was designed especially for me. Oh, well, really, it, it's the most original and charming hat I've seen this spring. Oh, my dear, I will simply not sleep a wink till I find one exactly like it. Or better yet, I shall have one made. Oh. And I just have time to get to my milliner's. Oh, oh goodbye, Mrs. McGee. Get to the You hear that, Molly? I certainly did, McGee. Imagine her wanting one exactly like it. Well, I've been made a chump out of long enough. Come on, give me that hat. No. Huh? No. If Abigail Uppington thinks this hat is cute, I'm going to wear it. You're going to wear it? Okay. I'll see you later. Wait a minute, dearie. Where are you going? I'm going out and buy a felt hat. That was the last straw. <laughs> At no time does a woman's role in life become more clear than when a country is at war and homes are threatened, because those homes are only as strong as the women who guide and keep them. Most of us men will admit openly or secretly that no job at any time is bigger or more important than home management, especially when budgets must be watched closely, when things must be conserved and made to last. You women really have several jobs rolled into one, feeding your families the right food, making and mending clothes for those young youngsters, and certainly not the least... Keeping your house clean because dirt wears things out. Those are no loafing assignments. And now, on top of those jobs, you save kitchen fats and salvage scrap materials for war production. You study first aid and enlist as air raid wardens. Yes, you are the guardians of our homes. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Glow Coat salute you, the housekeepers and homemakers of America and Canada. Ladies and gentlemen... In just a moment, we will hear the President of the United States from the White House in Washington. With all of us anxious to do everything we can, individually and collectively, to shoulder our share of the burdens of this war, we welcome this message from our Commander-in-Chief. We'll all be listening, Mr. President. This program came to you from Hollywood.